وأقول في القرآن ما جاءت به آياته فهو الكريم المنزل وأقول قال الله جل جلاله والمصطفى الهادي ولا أتأول الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على عبد الله ورسوله نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته We begin as always by praising Allah Azza wa Jal by asking Allah to exalt the mention and grant peace to our messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam his family and his companions Before we actually get into the topic of uh, the uh, episode today as part of this course on the Muslim family brought to you by al Madrasatul Umariya, I actually wanted to touch upon a question that was posted over and, and asked to me about some of the course material that we had covered previously. And actually what I wanted to say first of all is how wonderful and amazing it is. And definitely as a teacher, it is something that I appreciate so much is when you see that a student has really considered the content and really has gone through it and there are issues that have come up or questions that have come up that directly relate to the content. So I've had a few examples of this from the students who have been following the course, Alhamdulillah. We had an excellent question uh, early on regarding the authenticity of a particular hadith that I mentioned. And just look at what that shows from the point of view of the student. That you have a student who's taking the hadith, looking for the hadith, uh, where it's found in the books of the of the sunnah, checking the reliability and the authenticity of it. Wallah, that's, that just shows that you have students who really are, you know, really going through the content and, and really looking and trying their best to understand the points that have been raised. And sometimes when you do that, you're going to find things that your teacher got wrong or you're going to find things that you think at least you want to raise a question over it. You want to say, okay, uh, why did you mention this here? Or do you think that this is, is this appropriate to use in this context, for example? And as long as the question's asked in a sensible way, it's very, very beneficial for everyone. And especially for me, because it allows me to kind of go back and question the content that I put forward and ask myself, is this exactly did I make the point in the right way? Did I use that ayah or that hadith in the right way? Go back to the books of the scholars and go through it again and make sure. And then answer, inshallah, the, the question. So it's beneficial for everybody. And one of the questions I got asked later on, uh, quite recently, on the course, I thought was an excellent question. And I thought it highlighted something that I didn't mention. So the question came regarding a woman who owns her own house and whether or not she has the right to decide who enters into the house. So the question was that if you have rights that are opposite one another, or you have rights that go in pairs with each other, and in some of the ahadith we talked about the right of the husband to provide accommodation for his wife, for example, and then the contrast, like in the hadith of Jabir in Sahih Muslim, and then the contrast of it in terms of the woman that she doesn't allow anyone to enter into her home that her husband doesn't like or she doesn't allow anyone to sit on her husband's bed that her husband doesn't like. So the question that was asked, and I thought this was an excellent question, is what happens if the house is not provided by the husband? And this was a very, very good question because it really shows the student is really thinking about things. So what happens if the wife owns her own house and lives in a house that she owns for herself? In that situation, who is the one that has the right to decide who comes into the house? Is it still the husband? Or is it the case that because she owns that house and her husband is not providing a house for her, that she now has the right to decide who comes into the house and who doesn't? So this was a really good question. It was a question I wasn't sure of the answer to. I went back to the books of the scholars and the statements of the scholars, and I found a statement by Imam al hafiz ibn Hajar, Rahimahullah ta'ala in Fath al-Bari and likewise a statement of Al-Qurtubi Rahimahullah ta'ala and both of them stated unequivocally that it's still the husband's right to allow who comes into the house or who doesn't and they said that it's because the word here Baytihi, his house 
doesn't mean the house that he pays for. The word doesn't allow into his house. It doesn't mean the house that he pays for, but rather it means the house that he lives in. The house that he lives in. This was a point that al Hafid Ibn Hajar rahimullah ta'ala, he made that it, it's not the house that he pays for, but the house that he lives in. And the fact that he lives in it, and the fact he's married to that woman, and he has that qawama, that responsibility within the house, and that kind of, uh, as the head of the household, that the fact that he pays or doesn't pay for the house doesn't restrict him from having permission to control who comes into the house and who doesn't. And that was a benefit I thought I would like to share with everybody because it is quite a common thing in this day and age. It's not always the case uh, that the husband necessarily uh, provides the house. The, the lady might have her own house or it may be that before she got married, she already had a house and it might be that she had um, perhaps had a house of her own before she got married or she had been married before and she had a house and then she got married after again for a second time uh, and in that case she's still living in the house that she was living in before many situations in which the woman might own her own house and also here I, I thought there's a, a point that came to my mind when the question was first asked and I thought it was a good point uh, it just came into my mind that there's a difference between the situation of Nushuz and a situation of uh, a situation where it's it just happened like that. It's it's like a natural situation. So I give an example. In one situation, there's a woman who has her own house, and when she goes to get married, she says to her husband that uh, I would rather stay in the house that I already have. I, I like my house, and I've decorated it, and I'm I'm going to be staying there. And maybe the husband might pay the bills or whatever it is. Or she might even say to her husband, I'm not, you know, I, I'm more than happy to pay the bills. Because remember, him paying the bills is a right she has. And she can give up her right just like he can give up his right. And we talked about that when we talked about a sulh, making peace between the husband and, uh, and the wife. Or making an agreement between the two of them. So here, the, this is not a situation of marital discord. It's not a situation where the wife is refusing to obey the husband or where the husband is refusing to give rights to the wife and he's saying I'm not going to provide anything for you and I have no interest in it it's a situation which is either something that happened by agreement of both parties or something natural that was like that anyway so the the for example the woman she had her own house before and she's happy with it she's decorated it she likes it and she says to her husband I'm I'm I would like to stay here I don't really want to move to a new house and maybe she might even say to her husband that I'm, I, I'm, I want to pay the bills. I've always paid my bills. I don't want you to pay my, you know, my, my electricity bill or my gas bill or whatever. I've always paid them myself. So this is not a situation of mushuz. It's not a situation where she is not able any longer to obey her husband or where the husband is not able any longer to or not willing any longer to give his wife his rights. This is not a situation like that. And, be, and because it's not a situation like that, then the issue of one of them taking the rights away from the other, like as a punishment, it doesn't come into the equation at all. The second issue is when it is a situation of nushuz. The husband says, I'm not going to provide a house for you. I'm no longer willing to provide a house for you, for example. And I'm, or I'm not going to pay anything. And that is also a different situation. So I think you have to distinguish between the two of them. But having said that, still we go back to the statement of those two great scholars of Islam and indeed others mentioned it also. And that is to say that the, uh, the husband's right to, to allow people into the house or to decide who comes into the house is a right that's related to him living there, i.e. That, that it's his bait, it's the place where he lives, i.e. He's, he's married to that woman, and that's the place where he lives. That's what the right is related to, and it's not related to the fact that he owns the house or doesn't own the house, or that he pays for the house or doesn't pay for the house. That's what I found from their statements, and I thought I would answer that question. And I think from time to time, it doesn't hurt for us to answer uh, questions, uh, in, you know, for, for the students, inshallah, where those questions are directly related to the course material. I think things that are not directly related to the course material, there's definitely a place for answering those questions, inshallah, and I hope 
You're going to be seeing some of those Q&A sessions coming up, inshallah. But I think that sometimes when it relates directly to the course material, it is beneficial to uh, answer them directly from time to time for the students who've been following the course. And we hope that that was a benefit for everybody, inshallah ta'ala. So that being said, we're now going to move on to the content of the episode that we have for you today. And we've moved on completely from the topic of husband and wife. Now here I had a decision to make. And my decision to make was which family relationship should I speak about next? And half of me, I was inclined towards to talk about the rights of the parents because of the severity and the, the greatness and the importance of that bond that exists and that importance of that right that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made next to his rights. Worship Allah and don't make any partner with him and be good to your parents. But the reason I want to talk about children now and the reason this episode is going to be about children inshallah and the subsequent episodes that are coming up in the next few days are all going to be about children inshallah is because of the way that we structured the course in the beginning. Why did we begin with the husband and the wife? Why not begin with the parents? Because we took it in the chronological order or the natural order. And the natural order is that Allah Azza wa Jal began this race of Bani Adam, the human race. Allah Azza wa Jal began them by bringing together a husband and a wife, Adam and Hawa. The next chronological step is that Adam and Hawa had children. So I actually think that following that pattern, we want to start talking about the children and then we're going to talk about the child towards the, the child towards the parent. And some might say, well, don't those two rights come at the same time? Isn't it the case that the, uh, the, the I mean, obviously, as soon as you have children, the children, ha you have rights over them and they have rights over you. However, if you look at it chronologically, there are rights of the child that begin before the child is born and before the child is mukallaf, before the child is uh, responsible for their actions and before the child is required to do birrul walidain, to be good to their parents. So chronologically, the rights of the children probably come before in terms of the order they, they might come before the right of the parents because there are rights of the children that begin before the child is born. And there's also a link between the rights of the children and the rights of the husband and wife. And we're going to talk about that, inshallah ta'ala, as we come to it, inshallah ta'ala. So for me, I felt that it makes sense as we're going through things in order. And we spoke about how Allah began the human race from Adam and Hawa through marriage and then through children, then it makes sense that we start by talking about children. And then as time goes by, those children get a little bit older and we start talking about, okay, now the child is at the age of discernment of Tamiz where they can distinguish the difference between right and wrong. So now it becomes, uh, it becomes something that we should start talking about what they need to do towards their parents. And that's in chronological order and not in order of importance. Otherwise, if we're talking about order of importance, then no doubt the, the rights of the parents are the most important of all of the rights after the right of Allah Azza wa Jal. So we're talking about children and all I want to focus in this episode is that our children are a ni'mah, a blessing, and our children are a hiba, a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I think that when you realize the importance of our children and you realize that they are a blessing and you realize that they are a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that it is obligatory on you to show gratitude to Allah for this ni'mah and this hibah, this blessing and this gift, then that sets the scene for the importance of the rights of the children and their position in the family. Because when you realize the importance of something is when you realize its virtue and here, it's not the virtue of the child that we want to talk about necessarily, as in the child as a child, but we want to talk about the virtue of having a child, the, the blessing and the gift that a child is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's what we are going to talk about today, the children as a ni'mah, as a blessing and a hibah, and as a gift 
from Allah Azza wa Jal. Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala He told us in the Quran Lillahi mulku samawati wal ard yakhluqu ma yasha yahabu liman yasha inatha wa yahabu liman yasha dhukur aw yuzawwijuhum dhukranan wa inatha wa yaj'alu man yasha aqima innahu alimun qadir Surah Ash-Shura between ayah number 49 and ayah number 50 Everything in the heavens and the earth, belongs to Allah Azza wa Jal. Allah Azza wa Jal who is Al-Malik. Allah Azza wa Jal who is Maliki Yawm al-Din. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, everything in the heavens and the earth belongs to Him. And so whatever we receive of blessings are gifts from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So to Allah belongs everything in the heavens and everything in the earth. Allah gives Allah gives or Allah creates whatever He wants. He gives male children to whoever He wants. And He gives female children to whoever He wants. Or He brings them together and gives male and female children. Some people have male and female children. And whoever He wants, He makes them barren. He gives them no children at all. Indeed, he is Alimun Qadir. He is knowing of everything and he is able to do everything. This ayah is one of the most fundamental proofs that our children are a gift from Allah. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Yahab, Yahabu liman yasha. Allah gives the gift of male children to whoever he wants. And he gives the gift of female children to whoever he wants. And he gives the gift of putting together male and female children, a mix of boys and girls, to whoever he wants. And whoever he wants, he leaves them without any children at all. And that's the nature of a gift, right? You can give a gift or withhold a gift. And there's no blame on a person whether they give a gift or withhold a gift. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, walillahi al-mathal al-a'la, to Allah belongs the highest example. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He gives this gift of children. And to some people, He gives only boys. To some, He gives only girls. To some, He gives a mix of boys and girls. And to some, He makes them without, or He makes it that they are without children at all. And that is from the ilm of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, from the knowledge of Allah and from His qudra, from His immense and perfect ability and perfect knowledge that he distributes children in this way. And subhanAllah, in Islam, there is, no, uh, there is no kind of stigma attached to any of these situations because a Muslim recognizes that this situation came from Allah Azza wa Jal. It came from Allah Azza wa Jal that you have only boys and don't have any girls. And you see the family that has only boys and subhanAllah, perhaps they would wish for a girl. And there are some families that have only girls and perhaps they would wish for a boy. And there are some families that don't have any, they don't have any children at all. And we know how much that, how much a person wishes to have, wishes to have children. So all of this is a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And also this ayah, why I brought this ayah here is to emphasize to you and to make you think about the situation of the one that doesn't have any children. وَيَجْعَلُ مَنْ يَشَاءُ عَقِيمًا and he makes whoever he wishes barren without children. SubhanAllah, perhaps there would be a rich person from the richest of the people on this earth and they would give ma fil ard, they would give everything on the earth, jami'an, all of it, to be able to have a child. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made them aqeem, he made them the situation that they don't have any children. That's from the knowledge of Allah and his ability and the fact that Allah Azza wa Jal distributes the rizq to whoever he wants. Some people he gives money, some people he doesn't give money. Some people he gives children, some he doesn't give children. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives and distributes his rizq however he wants subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I brought this ayah for two reasons. Number one, to establish that children are a gift from Allah azza wa jal, and when you have a gift, you should always be grateful. It's a gift. Allah Azza wa Jal, He spoke about it using the word Yahabu. 
to give a gift. Allah Azza wa Jal gave it as a hibah, as a gift. And if it's a gift, then whenever you're given a gift, you should be grateful. And when the gift is something that people crave for and people would spend all the money that they have to achieve and people try and they go for medical treatments and they go for all kinds of things which are both draining upon health and upon financial resources only so that they can get this gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what is the situation like? How grateful should we be for the gift of children? For the gift of children and just remember those who don't have any children and how hard it is for them to be appreciative of this gift that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you and every gift you are given deserves gratitude and that shows us that we have to be grateful to Allah azza wa for everything that he has given us and it also shows you that if you are from those people who are not able to have any children or until now you haven't been able to have any children then it also shows you that you need to seek this blessing from the one who has it. You can't ask a gift from the, from the person that doesn't have that gift to give it to you. So like the people run around, maybe perhaps you see some of the people, they even go to the grave and they pray and they ask the person in the grave to give them children or they go to the magician or they go to the healer and they ask the healer to give them children. And perhaps some of them put complete faith in the doctor and they ask the doctor to give them children, not in the sense of just going for medical treatment and believing the blessing comes from Allah, but actually believing and having complete trust and hope that the doctor can give them children. And ultimately, you need to realize that none of those people, this gift is not in their hands. They don't own it. They're not from the people or they're not from, they're not the one that Allah said, وَلِلَّهِ مُلْكُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ To Allah belongs everything in the heavens and the earth. Allah creates what He wants. Allah gives this gift to whoever He wants. So if you're from those people who haven't been able to have children until now, and I say until now because there is no reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not decree for you to have children at a time that He knows. Subhanahu wa ta'ala, we're going to talk about the story of Zakaria and likewise uh, Ibrahim uh, alayhim as -salam regarding their children and having children late in life. This is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But you need to seek this gift from the one who controls it and the one who possesses it. And that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's the one that controls this. He's the one that possesses it. So if you haven't been able to have children and you are one of those people who want to have children, are trying to have children, but you couldn't, then make sure it is Allah Azza wa Jal that you are asking. And that doesn't mean that you can't seek a medical course or a medical treatment, or you can't seek a means that is from the, the means that Allah has placed on, in this earth in order to be able to have children. But ultimately, it is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So attach your heart to Allah and make your dua towards Allah and put your worship and your effort towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then take the causes and the means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed. And that's a principle in everything that we have in this world and everything that we want in this world, whatever it is, whether it is of wealth or children or anything from the zinat al hayat al dunya, from the adornment of this world, is that we ask it from Allah azza wa jal and we put our heart and attach our heart to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then we take whatever means Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made permissible for us to take. On that topic, Allah azza wa jal said, Al-malu wal-banuna zinatul hayati dunya wal-baqiyatu salihatu khayrun inda rabbika thawaba wa khayrun amala. Surah Al-Kahf, ayah number 46. Allah azza wa jal said, wealth and children are the adornment of the life of this world. And the baqiyatu salihat. Baqiya, it means something that remains. And obviously saliha is something which is righteous. The righteous remains or the remaining righteous things are better in the sight of your Lord in reward and better in hope. Subhanallah, think about this ayah. What a beautiful ayah. And we can definitely take a benefit from this in terms of our children are a ni'mah that Allah Azza wa Jal, He described wealth and children as the adornment of this world. The adornment of this worldly life. It's like they, they are a, an adornment, something that makes this worldly life beautiful. 
decorates it and makes it beautiful and makes it pleasing is that you have wealth and children. And we said this is an evidence that wealth and children are both from the provision of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the things that Allah gives to people as a gift. He gives it to some people, he doesn't give it to others. And to some he gives a lot and to some he gives very few and to some he doesn't give any at all subhanahu wa ta'ala. But Allah said, وَالْبَاقِيَاتُ الصَّالِحَاتِ The righteous remaining, the things that are righteous that remain. So this is an interesting question. What are the baqiyatu salihat? What are these righteous things which remain that are better in reward and better for, you know, and better in hope? What are they, what are these things? I mean, how many people live their life hoping for money? How many live their life hoping for children? You know, seeking the rewards, the, the worldly rewards of having children. Like someone, you know, continuing your lineage, like someone uh, who uh, is uh, going to serve you when you're older, like someone who's going to provide income for you when your income has ceased and so on. These are things that people seek from the, the rewards of the worldly life, from the, from the matters of the worldly life from the, they, that they wish for for children. So what are the baqiyat al-salihat? The scholars of tafsir, they have a lot of different opinions. But here, all of their different opinions, they come back to one thing. And that are the baqiyat al-salihat refer to the righteous good deeds. The righteous good deeds. And that could be the salawat al-khams, the five daily prayers. It could be other things from the things that the scholars mentioned of tafsir. But ultimately, all of their opinions, generally speaking, can be summarized in the sentence that al-baqiyat al-salihat are the righteous good deeds. The righteous good deeds. Those are more important than what Allah Azza wa Jal has given you from wealth and children. And this gives us a principle. And that is that Allah Azza wa Jal gives the dunya to those whom he loves and those whom he doesn't. But he only gives the akhirah to those whom he loves. Allah Azza wa Jal gives the dunya to those who he loves. There are people who Allah loves in this dunya who have children, many children. There are people whom Allah loves in this dunya that have lots of money. There are people whom Allah Azza wa Jal hates in this dunya that have many children. And there are people whom Allah hates in this dunya that have lots of money. Ultimately, you having children or having money and wealth doesn't make you beloved to Allah. It doesn't make you from the people who will have a high standing in the Akhirah. What matters are the good deeds that you put forward. But here there's an interesting subtle point, a little subtlety or a little subtle point here, and that is you can use your wealth and your children to be from the Baqiyat al-Salihat. You can make it from the deeds that remain. By putting that effort in and by thanking Allah for that blessing and using that blessing to please Allah, the mal and the banoon, the wealth and the children that are the zina, the decoration of this worldly life can become from the baqiyat al-salihat, from the righteous good deeds that really matter by using the blessings you have been given for Allah Azza wa Jal. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you that blessing, if Allah Azza has given you the blessing, whether it be wealth, whether it be children, or anything else from the blessings, health, or free time, or knowledge, uh, either knowledge of the worldly life or knowledge of the religion, which is even more important, whatever Allah has given you, use it and make it from the Baqiyat al-Salihat. Don't make it from something which is nothing more than the Zinatul al hayat al-Dunya, nothing more than the decoration of this world. Because that doesn't distinguish the righteous from the people who are not righteous. Because Allah gives this dunya to those who He loves, or those whom He loves, and those whom He doesn't love. But Allah only gives the akhirah to those whom He loves. So use, and this is again another emphasis upon the blessing of your children, use the blessing of children to get near to Allah. Don't make it something that just decorates the, your worldly life for you that just makes your life look beautiful, but make it something that really remains Yawm Al-Qiyamah and is something which is worth it. And you have you've really shown gratitude to Allah for that particular blessing. Allah said in Surah Ali Imran, زُيِّنَ لِلنَّاسِ حُبُّ الشَّهَوَاتِ مِنَ النِّسَاءِ وَالْبَنِينَ وَالْقَنَاطِيرِ الْمُقَنْطَرَةِ مِنَ الذَّهَبِ وَالْفِضَّةِ 
والخيل المسومة والأنعام والحرث ذلك متاع الحياة الدنيا والله عنده حسن المآب Allah Azza wa Jal said that people are people زين للناس people have it's become be- it's been made beautiful to people the love of الشهوات the love of their desires people's desires and the love that they have for those desires have been made beautiful for them whether it be women children piles of gold and silver branded horses cattle or land these are all from the things that have been made beautiful to people and i brought this because it is a ni'mah of allah azza wa jal all of these things are from the ni'mah of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all of these things are from the ni'mah from the blessings of allah azza wa jal an nisa to have a righteous wife al banin to have children al qanatir al muqantarat min al dhahab wal fidda gold and silver in piles upon piles horses cattle land all of these are from the ni'am of Allah azza wa jalla but ultimately they are from the things that can be used for good or for evil and can be used to please Allah or can be used to anger Allah or can become from the things which are just neutral which don't benefit you anything they neither benefited you nor they harmed you so again it's about seeing the blessing of children look at how Allah azza wa jalla mentioned this the children he mentioned it second in the list of these things that people love to have so if you've been given something people love to have you have to use it in a way that is pleasing to Allah azza wa jalla this is the mata' al hayat al dunya it is the provision and the temporary enjoyment of this life but Allah azza wa jalla the final destination and the and the beauty and the amazing nature of the akhirah this is what is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we said the hadith in which the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said ad dunya mata' this world is nothing but a temporary enjoyment and the best temporary enjoyment is al mar'atu salihah a righteous wife and Allah azza wa jalla mentioned after the the righteous wife Allah azza wa jalla mentioned from the mata' ad dunya from the Uh, adornment and the temporary enjoyment of the dunya is children and so children are a blessing and a gift from Allah azza wa jalla who controls everything in the heavens and everything in the earth that's all we have time for in this uh, episode inshallah ta'ala we're going to be continuing with the theme that our children are a gift in the next episode but we're also going to look at the fact that our children are a test and a trial and so it's not just that our children are a gift and a blessing but they're also a test and a trial and we're going to look at that also in the next episode inshallah ta'ala that's what allah made easy for me to mention in the time that i have and allah azza wa jalla knows best was salatu was salam ala nabiyyina muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in assalamu alaykum if you're enjoying these videos and you'd like to keep up to date with all of the courses we're going to be running make sure you head over to amau at home.com